Hey everyone, welcome to week 13. I gave up on doing the numbers. I get confused, I'm dumb that way. Week 13, day three, I can count to five, so day three on our gouache week. So uh, first day we painted uh, Fer with uh, my jacket on top of her. Uh, second day we painted... What did I paint? Dani, que pinté? Ayer? Ah, my sister. My, my sister. Uh, I painted my sister with her blonde hair, kind of like a blue shirt. I really like the shape, the, um, the overall kind of shape of, of that painting. And I'm kind of isolating gouache a little bit. I'll try not to do that today. And what I'm finding most exciting about it is treating it first as watercolor, as much as you can treat gouache as watercolor. Uh, so very transparently, leaving some areas transparently because I think that it looks really, really nice and then some areas try to work them um, opaquely. I'm really liking it, but I, I really do feel it's, uh, it's labor. It's very, very difficult for me. I'm a very impatient painter. So when I, when I work with oils, I know I can add, 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 add. I think one of the toughest things during these days has been recognizing or trying to recognize when I can you know, put more paint on top and when I have to stop and let something dry and set. Oof, again, very tough for me. I have no patience. So let's see what we do today. And I'm going to try to integrate some of the uh, background just so it feels like, you know, it belongs to a space. But let's see what we do. Okay, let's get started with our third painting, our third gouache painting today, Wednesday. I'll give you guys a small report on, <laughs> on what I think has happened with my uh, first two attempts. I think they've been successful up to some point, but I also feel like they have enlightened me into things that I should be wary about when I'm painting with gouache. Now, for the first day, I actually kind of liked that I was able to recognize that I can treat gouache in the same way that I would treat a watercolor. So the washes that you can get with gouache, they're not quite the same. They're not quite the same as a watercolor wash because of the chalk that gouache has in it. That's what actually makes it opaque. So the color is actually suffering a little bit. And by that, I mean that the uh, saturation of the pigments. So if you want to understand it in a way, just think about mixing a tiny bit of white with your watercolor pigment. And that's what gouache is. Gouache has a higher pigment load also. So it does behave a little bit differently, but that's basically the big difference between watercolor and gouache. So it's pigment load and the fact that it has chalk in it, making it opaque. So while the washes can be accessible through a very thin down, a very watered down um, first layer of gouache, they're not quite as punchy and vibrant as a very nice uh, watercolor pigment, but you do have access to that. In Monday's painting and in yesterday's painting, there were areas that I just left as washes and I was quite satisfied. It just feels very fresh, very direct. I feel I can put marks down and they kind of stay. It sticks. So it's very, very nice. I haven't wet my paper. I haven't painted wet on wet. Mm, I may try to do that, although knowing you know me, my sensibility, and my lack of patience, I don't know if I'll have the... Uh, right mindset to just wait for 15 minutes for the paper to dry, to fully dry so I can paint on a drier substrate. But I was happy that in those two paintings, in Mondays and Tuesdays, I was able to leave a couple of areas that were washy. In Mondays, I left the jacket and I built up my opaque paint with the portrait and the hands. And on yesterday's painting, I left part of the hair in shadow and some areas in the um, hair and light as washy because I wanted to have more subtle transitions. I was speaking about how I was a little frustrated that I, I could have done more intelligent transitioning between the more transparent areas and the opaque areas. And I'm kind of trying to do that. It's very, very tough. And one of the toughest things about dealing with transparency is that you can never go back to what once was. So it is this technical thing where if you cover paint up, then you will never be able to have access to the original paint layer that you had put initially. 
which means that I have to be very, very careful about not covering up the transparent areas of the painting. Those are gone once I cover them. Like I said on Monday, the only thing about that is it's kind of teaching me to be a little bit hesitant just because I have to be careful about not covering them. And I don't want to overcompensate by just being too afraid of covering them up. I think that that's the toughest, toughest thing. Like I said, there's no way back once you start putting opaque paint down. So I have to be very, very careful. But I'm very happy that I'm finding a little bit of a middle ground where I can use those two qualities. Now, people could say, well, if you want a more transparent quality, you could start by using watercolor and put some opaque touches on top. But like I said, I don't want to have the watercolor aspect of gouache paint be the uh, predominant factor when I'm doing gouache. I actually want to teach myself how to not be scared of these opaque moments and to be more mindful about mixing these, these very clear, clean decisions in my palette, which means that I have to be more patient, more patient in the sense that I have to recognize how to decipher what I'm looking at and also how I'm trying to solve it in my palette. I have to take a lot more time in my palette mixing paint. And I think that that's, uh, that's a little bit difficult for me because I am a very messy painter and that's not great. And I have grown accustomed to just mixing paint in a manner in which I don't know if it's too conducive to clean gouache painting. So there's a bunch of practices that are just bad habits, I would call them, that I have in oil painting that I think I have to get rid of if I'm trying to do a very clean gouache painting. I hadn't said it, but my palette is basically my oil painting palette. I have a titanium white, I have a lemon yellow, yellow ochre, cad red, alizarin, raw umber, and ultramarine blue. That's the palette I'm using. I'm not using a super, super saturated palette. I've noticed that a lot of people that paint with gouache nowadays, they have these ridiculous range of hues with crazy saturation. I don't have that. I want to do very simple painting and for now just concentrate on how paint handles. I think that that's the most important part of what I'm doing right now. And what I was able to recognize with the first two paintings is that paint doesn't flow as much as I would want to. Even the washes, they don't flow as much as I would want to. Granted, that, that probably has to do with my substrate, with my paper. It's probably absorbing quite a little bit. I haven't tried watercolor papers that have size on them. So right now I know that my paper is absorbent, but it's a hell of a paper, so I'm not gonna complain or, or blame the paper. But I do feel there's a, a draggy quality to uh, gouache. I'm trying to understand if that's part of gouache's nature or if I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I'm not using enough paint or maybe, like I said, maybe I have to try and use different paper. My alternatives are, I either have to use a lot of paint to try to have a, like a more free flowing um, mixing surface, or I have to uh, use water, use a lot of water, but the bad thing about that is that it just thins the paint down. So it is flowy once I mix it with water, but once I start working a little more opaquely, I do feel that there's very much so a drag to it. So I'm trying to figure out how much of that is my own fault in, in terms of how I'm handling it, or it's my materials, or it's just the nature of the paint that I'm using. Now, when I was studying, I remembered somebody telling me in illustration class that Harry Anderson, Harry Anderson was a great mid 20th century American illustrator. Somebody had told me that Harry Anderson was allergic to oil paint and he had moved to gouache then to do his illustrations, which are absolutely amazing. I mean, the guy was just an insanely, insanely good painter. He used to work with Haddon Sunbloom. So if you guys don't know, he's the guy that did the Quaker Oats guy and he did the uh, Coke Santa. Uh, he painted Santa for like 35 years for uh, the uh, Coca-Cola company in Chicago. So he's amazing. He actually taught um, Gil Elfgren and he taught Andrew Loomis. So, you know, that's how good and how big Haddon Sunbloom is. So there is kind of like a, a flowy characteristic to Sunbloom's painting and obviously Harry Anderson. And I was just like, 
in awe because I, I, I thought, how could you do this in, in gouache? It's crazy. That's, it just doesn't seem to lend itself to be painted in this way. And later on, I realized that Harry Anderson didn't really use gouache. He used casein paint. And casein does behave very differently from gouache. Gouache, like watercolor, has gum arabic as a binder. And casein has actually casein, the protein that comes from milk. So it is closer to how oil paint actually behaves. And it does lend itself to be more free-flowing. Casein was very, very popular. But eventually acrylics got invented and they just kind of pushed away casein. But even today, James Gurney does a bunch of stuff on casein and it's, it's incredible. But here's the thing. I don't want to be one of those painters that says, oh yeah, let's blame it on the uh, technique. Yeah, it's, yeah, this painting is not working out because it's not casein. Because I would feel that what I'm doing, which made sense for Harry Anderson when he was told by doctors that he was allergic to uh, turpentine and that's why he eventually had to not paint in oils. But when he was told he was allergic because he was nauseous and he would have like stomach cramps, he was trying to find something that was the closest thing that he could relate to oil paint. So he was trying to find that, that, that paint that was going to be open and flowy and he landed on casing. And Oof, he pushed the medium like crazy. If you look at some of Harry Anderson's casing paintings, they are oil paintings. My God, I mean, there's certain moments where you can see the drag of the brush and you can tell that it's a, a water-soluble medium. But, oof, I mean, it's insane. He he was that good. He actually made that transition just masterfully. It's It's absolutely incredible, I feel. But that's not my case. Like, I don't have his ability, <laughs> first. And second, I don't want gouache to behave like oil paint because if it does behave like oil paint, then what's the point? Then <laughs> there's no transitioning there and there's no challenge in there because I would just say, oh, this is like oil paint, but I just use water and it's exactly the same and it behaves exactly the same. I actually like that gouache has its own attributes and it has its own problems and it has its own nature. So one of the things that I've always been annoyed about gouache and I'm trying to work around it is the fact that there is a value change and a saturation change while the painting is drying. That is super, super annoying to me because I'm not used to that. I'm always used to knowing that when I paint in oils, my pigment doesn't change. It can oxidize and you can see it maybe uh, become a little bit dull or matte, but that's because the outer layer of the paint has oxidized. But you can just varnish your painting and you can see your original colors again. And if you want to do a bunch of layers when you paint, you can oil out or you can use retouch varnish and you're going to be totally fine. You're going to have access to whatever hue and saturation you painted initially. But with gouache, you can't. And that's why I wouldn't even dare try to paint a second layer of a painting in gouache like the day after I started it. Because it's insane. There's no way, and my experience, I'm, I'm, I'm sure people can do this after 30 years of painting with gouache, but you know, with the little tiny experience that I have, I don't know how my uh, pigments behave and I can't really recognize what they're going to look like once they have dried as opposed to what they look like when they're fresh. And that's very, very tough. So if I would have to retouch a painting and try to match my colors, oh my God, I, I really do feel that that's an almost impossible task. You know, having worked these two paintings and today the third one, I actually understand why it's just a very, very direct medium. Like you start a painting, you have to finish it and you're done. But it's kind of strange just to see how the painting changes as it's drying because I'm very, very sensitive to those things. And the shifts in value are just insane. Like your, your darker colors are going to dry lighter and your lighter colors are going to dry a little bit darker. But I've noticed that some colors, especially lighter colors, they go darker and then they go a little bit lighter once they dry. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. With darker colors, I do realize that they, they don't fluctuate. They just go dark to light. But I'm liking that. Like I said, my, my objective is not to find something that can mimic oil painting because then, you know, what's the point? Actually, it would be nice not to deal with uh, solvents or mediums or anything like that. Just the directness of this paint is just absolutely wonderful, I feel. And for years, I've been wanting to make a transition towards water-soluble paints. They're 
less of a hassle. They're easier to clean up. They're easier on your brushes. But like I said, I don't want to find a substitute for my oil paint, for now at least. I just want to try and find the beauty in this other technique and what it can offer to me and how I have to accommodate my habits, again, some of them really bad ones, so that I can paint with this particular technique and actually get the most out of it. And I'm liking it. I'm happy that I'm giving myself the chance to find my way through masses of color instead of, of relying on those drawing marks that I put on, um, on Fer's painting the uh, first day. I didn't do that with my sister's painting yesterday. And I'm not doing it today with Tyson's painting. So I do have a underdrawing that it's fairly resolved, I guess. This is, you know, what you would consider a sketchy underdrawing. And it's just to give myself a little bit of, of an easier time when I put paint down because I am just unfamiliar with this paint. So I'm just giving myself like a, like a better chance and not just telling myself, okay, this is new. Uh, you have to deal with how the paint handles, but you also have to deal with your drawing while you're painting. Ugh, that's always very, very tough. So I think that's a good sort of summary of what I've learned. And the uh, cool thing about today, which is different from what I was trying to do Monday and Tuesday, is that I didn't isolate the uh, figure. So Monday and Tuesday, I wanted to do that because I loved the overall shape. In Luisa's case, yesterday, and in Fer's case, Monday, I really wanted to keep that contour, that very, very clean contour of that shape. And for today, I, I didn't. I wanted to relate a little bit what was going on with the wood floor and how it kind of seeped into the colors of Tyson. So I wanted to make it a little more atmospheric, and I think I got that. The one thing that I did, and you probably already noticed this if you've seen the image of this painting on Instagram, is that I cropped it. I really thought I had way too much space up top and way too much space in the bottom. And it was taking your eye off of the one area where I wanted your attention to be, which obviously was Tyson's head and uh, his paws. So I wanted that to be, in terms of hierarchy, the moment where you would land and then everything else would kind of dissolve. So I realized I had cropped them. I was going to correct that when I was drawing, but I was like, no, 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 I actually like this size. I want to paint on this size. So I don't mind that those legs are being cut off to the right. And what I told myself was, okay, I'll just keep those unfinished and washy and I'll build up my paint towards the left side of the picture. And, you know, I'm very happy with how that ended up. But it actually made me realize that I needed to crop the paintings so as not to have areas within the painting which would take your eye away from what was the area of interest. I don't usually do this. I don't like to do that because I think that's a little bit of hacking when you do that, but that's totally fine. Um, recomposing something is absolutely fine. I've just always liked to push myself to compose something on a very specific dimension and proportion. And ah, today it didn't work out, but again, you know, cropping after the fact is totally fine. And I think it made a far stronger picture. So I hope you guys liked it. I felt it was, um, again, a very nice learning experience, but I'm super happy that I'm actually surrendering myself and saying, okay, this is different. Let me try to learn how different it is. So I'll see you guys tomorrow for our fourth uh, gouache painting. And um, that's it. So thank you very much. Bye.